remind us that interference in Africa started with slavery. When slavery had lost its value, it graduated into colonization. And that is the context in which Berlin must be seen when the European powers sat in Berlin and divided the continent of Africa into spheres of influence. When colonization had lost its luster through a combination of certain realities and agitation from the continent, we regained our independence. But as John Henry Clark, that great African-American said, we regained independence by mimicking European governance systems. And he rightly says, no African country will ever succeed on the basis of those systems. After that, the neo-colonial project was instituted. And all of us will remember Kwame Nkrumah's book, Neo-Colonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism and he dare says the most dangerous. We are now in a neo-colonial stage when the European powers are at their most diabolical, when the Americans are at their most diabolical, and it's not lost on me that they'll be meeting in Hiroshima next week at the G7. And how do they interfere? They interfere militarily. They ensure that you in the military are trained in Sandhurst, are trained in West Point, so they affect your mind. They interfere diplomatically, sometimes through gunboat diplomacy. And that is why you see sometimes your typical European ambassador treats our heads of states in a condescending manner. They interfere through institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. They interfere by ensuring that our economic infrastructure is beholden to theirs through dollarization. They interfere through education. They interfere by influencing our processes by lending us advisors who tell us what to do, the neo-colonial project is alive and well. And it is at its most dangerous, and we Africans must smell the coffee. If we don't, they are going to continue to interfere. How else do they interfere? Through NGOs, Danida, CEDA, UK Aid, USAID. These are Trojan horses that are introduced into our countries for the purpose of influencing our processes. And they infiltrate our institutions. Right now, if you look at the African Development Bank, look at the shareholding. It's Americans, it's Germans, it's Japanese, it's the French. And the Europeans have done their bit. They also interfere through post-colonial institutions, the Commonwealth of independent nations. They are not sovereign states, former French-speaking nations. These are the instruments that they interfere through. And how do we then deal with this situation? We Africans must now begin to recognize, and this was recognized as early as 1963, and the chair of the commission is here. They'll be celebrating 60 years in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And 60 years ago, on the 24th day, of May, Kwame Nkrumah warned us. He said, if we are not united, they are going to interfere with us militarily. They are going to interfere with our economy. They are going to interfere with our agriculture. They are going to interfere with our health. Our duty, and I hope that when African heads of states and government meet in Addis next week, it will not be another jamboree at which pro forma speeches are read. I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa Agenda 2063, 
I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa continent of free trade area. I hope it will be an occasion to revitalize the Malabo Declaration, the Maputo Declaration, the Yamasukru Declaration. In other words, we Africans, as I conclude, we Africans must stop operating in silos. Rwanda alone will not confront them. Burundi alone will not confront them. But if we go through the regional bodies and ultimately the African Union, we may indeed succeed in putting away this bulwark. And remember, it is no longer just Europe. There is a new scramble for Africa. The Chinese are here. The Turks are here. The Qataris are here. All of them are coming back. And the military basis that you see here is telling you that if you don't behave, we are going to use force. Sometimes I wish, and I'm saying this seriously, that we too had a nuclear weapon. Because that is what Europe and America understands. The impact of European and American and Russian and Chinese interference is a raw wound. It is not something that is in the past. It is something that is happening as we speak. And therefore, when we speak to it, we are speaking to it to warn ourselves of the reality. When we speak about the Danidas and the NGOs, these are bodies whose raison d'etre is to ensure that we remain in a perpetual state of begging. That is what we are doing to warn ourselves. And we are not for one minute saying that we will shut ourselves out from the rest of the world. What we are saying is that we must define how we engage with the whole world. And we are saying that as individual countries, we are weak and the rest of the world wants to operate and to deal with us in our weak state. The United States of America dealing with Rwanda on second-hand clothing. Rwanda cannot resist them. Burundi cannot. Kenya cannot. Uganda cannot. But if we are East Africa with a population of 300 million, we can. If we are Sadak, we can. If we are Ikoas, we can. So this is what we are saying. And we are saying further that going forward, we must also recognize our internal weaknesses. And what is our weaknesses? Chinua Achebe said it very well. The problem of Africa is simply and squarely one of political leadership. The rank of many political leaders in Africa are thieves. Let's call them by their name. They are thieves. They are individuals who are not interested in the interest of this country. And as long as we continue electing such individuals into positions of power across Africa, they are going to be manipulated. What then is the responsibility of the citizenry? The responsibility of the citizenry is to make demands. The chairman here, I hope he has received the several letters that I've written to him. I've written several letters to his organization talking about the role of the African Union in peacemaking, I wrote to, this, to the chairman only one, last week about the situation in Sudan, saying we must solve our own problems. And I want to see a crusading African Union so that it's not the Americans and the Saudi Arabians who are summoning them to Jeddah. It should be in Addis Ababa. In a nutshell, Joe, what I'm saying is that we have a responsibility to ourselves both at the leadership level and at levels of the civic society, we must be engaged in a positive manner and we must keep on shouting without being diplomatic because diplomacy is lulling us into a false sense of security. And lastly, I want to say this. When foreign powers come, we must always be reminded of these goodies that they bring to us. It used to be said, of the Trojan War, that even when the Greeks bear a gift, they do not mean well. They never mean well. And the sooner we say it, recognizing the external threat, recognizing the domestic weaknesses, 
the safer we are. Right now, as I conclude, there is a group of experts going around East Africa collecting views about the constitution of East Africa. I've just written to them this morning. They are leaving Kenya. If you ask 10 Kenyans, possibly only one knows they are in Kenya. Then they will be going to Burundi. If you ask your typical African about Africa Agenda 2063 out of 10, if two know about Africa Agenda 2063, you'll be lucky. If you ask them about the Africa Continental Free Trade Area 10, if two know, you'll be lucky. In other words, we are not doing well. And I'm going to be blunt at these functions. If you ask the chair of the African Union, who funds the African Union, possibly 60% of the budget is externally funded. He who pays the piper calls the tune. That is the reality of the world. We must begin to pay for our own things in order to be understood and to be respected. In other words, Africa recognizes the need to define herself and to define her agenda. And I do not begrudge nations that define themselves and their agenda. Ronald Reagan once said it, and I agreed with him, that every nation does what is in her best interest. And I have no problem with that. The problem that we have is that at critical moments in African history, we have failed to seize the moment. You will remember in 1917 at the Champaran campaign, Mahatma Gandhi told Charlie Andrews, I do not want you to participate because at this point in time, the Indians must believe that they can do it themselves. In other words, there comes a time in the history of a nation when even friends of goodwill must be told, keep aside. We want to believe that we can do it and your help must be surreptitious and subterranean if you are a person of goodwill. And the Shamparan philosophy is what we must define for ourselves. In the year 2005, the former Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair, put together 17 individuals in what was then called the, our common interest. The report on the African Commission the Prime Minister, he was then the President of the European Union from which Britain has now left and he was also the President of uh, the G8 at that time before the exclusion of Russia. They produced the report. Right now, when I see the Blair Institute moving around Africa, they are implementing exactly what was in that particular report and I have a copy of it, not for the benefit of Africa but for the benefit of the Institute and what they have done is to sugarcoat it and camouflage it for the purpose of hoodwinking Africa and for the purposes of creating an environment which benefits foreign companies to the detriment of the continent of Africa. So that some of these engagements are anodynal, they simply lull us into a false sense of security. Do I blame them? No. That is why I agree that we must decolonize all learning. You, we, you know, I don't know who said it this, that, that if you have a, that the happiness of the slave is the comfort of the slave owner. And, and I'm saying that if Africa does not recognize this, then Africa will never recognize and realize our potential. The saying goes that if you behave like grass, goats will eat you. And many times we in the African continent behave like grass and we are fit for eating. And that is what I'm saying going forward in a strategic engagement such as this. It is incumbent upon the continent of Africa. And remember I said there is a new scramble, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle. There was one month in this continent when the Russian foreign minister was here, the American foreign minister for here was here, the Chinese foreign minister was here, the French president was here, the Turkish president for, was here, when, within a period of two weeks. What were they looking for? What is in their best interest? 
They engage little countries. They don't want to engage the East African community. They don't want to engage SADC. They don't want to engage ECOWAS because when they are big, they are not manipulable. And when on the 14th and 15th days of last year, the African heads of states and government were summoned, and I use the word summoned very deliberately to Washington, D.C. After the president had spoken to them and given them photo ops, they were given, Africa was given 60 billion, 54 countries, 60 billion. And then the American president started engaging in bilateral agreements with Burundi, with Lesotho, with Kenya. That is what we are saying, that going forward we must be conscious. And as to training our own Ngugi Wathiongo in a book called The River Between, tells his lead character Waiyaki, go unto him, learn what he has taught you, but bring it home and customize it for the benefit of our people. Learning is universal and defies geography, but there is wisdom in using that learning for our benefit. And very lastly, how do we distinguish the institutional conceptual West, which is diabolical, and the individual members of those countries that actually sometimes are on our side? Institutionalized conceptual West as articulated through government is fundamentally diabolical. Their pretension to the contrary notwithstanding. And therefore, when we engage with them, we must have our guards up. We are capable, in my view, of discerning who is better, and that is the duty of our leadership. Our leadership doesn't do a good job out of it, and that is why the demand from the civil society, the demand from academia must remind leadership at all times, you are dealing, you are dining, and I'm using this as a term of art, that when you are dining with the devil, you must do so with a long spoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Uh, I don't know that you wanted to respond to the issue of definition uh, yeah. earlier on, or indeed any Perhaps comments that you might have. So, Let us not drown ourselves in semantics. This is my view with due respect. First of all, let us remember that, and I always warn us Africans, if I was using my mother tongue to define interference, or using a Kiswahili word, what meaning would it carry? And sometimes we find ourselves prisoners of Portuguese, prisoners of French, prisoners of English or any other colonial language which we have appropriated and which we now deploy in terms of engagement. History has demonstrated, and my good friend Kegoro said it, history has demonstrated not once, not twice, that the intentions appear to be noble in the beginning, but when they have come in like the proverbial Trojan horse, they go beyond their mandate. Show me! what is happening to Libya today. Show me what is happening to the Central African Republic. Show me what is happening to Somalia today. They were all well intentioned and see the product. A tree shall be judged by its fruit. A mango that says it is an orange is still a mango. <laughs> okay. Now to the question that I've been asked, that is what can Africa do particularly with foreign interference? Let us understand that the international economic architecture as I see it is one in which Africa did not participate, does not participate in a meaningful way. Take, for example, the Bretton Woods institution that we know about, the World Bank and the IMF, created in 1944 in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, British economists and American economists immediately after the World War II to target the reparation of Europe through the Marshall Plan. We are grafted into it and then we become beholden to them. So that when you hear IMF is in your country, you ought to be very worried because the prescriptions is one size fits all. And if you doubt me, 
you will remember the prescriptions of the IMF during the structural adjustment in 1980s. Not a single country came out of it in a proper shape. We are not involved in that architecture. Remember also the WTO, the very first meeting of the United Nations in 1945 in San Francisco had a component of the WTO. The WTO as we know it today is also constructed in a manner that does not benefit us. The idea is that Africa continues to remain a producer of primary goods and we continue to consume goods that have value addition. How then has Africa tried to react to this? There have been several initiatives. The very early initiatives were not even constructed by Africa. If you remember the African Pacific, Caribbean Pacific, the Lomé Convention and the Cotonou Declaration, these were initiatives which were influenced from outside. It is after the failure of the Lomé Convention that Africa now said, we want to have our own, hence the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980, because Africa recognized trade within Europe is at almost 60%. Trade within North America is at anything 57%. Trade within Asia is at 50%. Trade within Latin America is at 40%. Trade within Africa, 15%. But the Lagos Plan of Action did not realize the dreams that we set for ourselves. So Africa has always identified the solution to our problems. In fact, and... The president, the, the president of the commission, of the chairman commission, will agree with me. If you listen to Kwame Nkrumah when he spoke on 24th day of May, 1963, he said, the only way in which we are going to ensure that we survive in this hostile world is to have one government. Perhaps some said he was naive, he was too idealistic, but he could see it. He could see that the smaller we are, the weaker we are in all aspects. He said, even one army, even one foreign policy. He said, and people thought he was naive. In 2013, when we came up with Africa Agenda 2063, and I invite you to read the letter written, the letter written by Nkosazan and Lamini Zuma, from whom the president took over. He, she is apologizing to Kwame Nkrumah. She's saying, with, with, we wish we listened to you. So what are we doing as Africa in terms of trying to deal with this foreign interference? Having recognized these, first of all, under the RECs, the East African community, you remember there was the committee of fast tracking of the East African community and East African Confederation, the first president of East Africa ought to have been sworn in in 2010. Mm -hmm. It did not happen. As I'm talking to you, there is now a body that is moving out, around trying to create a constitution for the East African Confederacy, which is a realization that if we want to interfere, if we want to stop foreign interference and we want to engage constructively, we must have a big market, we, and that market will be the East African market. Hence, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, and now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Somalis are coming in, and I'm told the Ethiopians are also contemplating. And not only in East Africa, in ECOWAS, there was even an attempt to create a currency called the ECO, which was torpedoed, as you know, by the French. And in SADC, these are ways and means of immunizing ourselves against the machinations of not only Europe, but China. China is increasingly coming into the continent. The, uh, Russia is increasingly coming into the continent. Turkey is increasingly coming into the continent. Qatar is increasingly coming into the continent. The Emiratis are coming into the continent. So we are seeing all these things happening. But beyond the wrecks, there is also the African Union. If you read Africa Agenda 2063 and the seven aspirations, they are designed specifically to ensure that we form a bulwark against these foreign interference. And let me correct myself if I was misunderstood. They are small nations. Let's not delude ourselves. The theory of sovereignty of nations 
is a fiction. Right now, we will have meeting of the G7. Why? Because there are bigger economies and we are not there. Then we'll have the G20, which are slightly bigger. Then there are the smaller nations, and they met recently in Brussels. So there is, we must distinguish the fiction of equality of nations and the reality of nations. And when, therefore, we want to negotiate at the continent of Africa, we are saying the bigger we are, the better we are. So efforts are there. And as I conclude, I'm saying, if we look at Agenda 2063 and we look at Africa continental free trade area to eliminate tariff and non-tariff barriers, to allow for the free movement of persons, then we would be better in, we would be in a better position to engage. And I'll give this example. Look at East Africa. We said that we did not want second-hand clothing. Rwanda accepted. Then Uganda and Tanzania were persuaded by the United States of America, and we dropped out. This is what divide and rule is all about. So these things that we are talking about, they are not going to be realized in your lifetime. These are intergenerational battles. And our duty, as Nyerere said on the sixth day of March 1997, this generation has a duty to carry the torch. And the worst mistake that we can make is to lose hope and to despair. Thank you. Thank you.